says that we are live. <laughs> okay, try it now. We, it says we are live. And are we live? It's always the question as we begin. I hope that we hear from someone soon that says we're live. And we are live. Hello, Lorraine Wilson and Pat Berberich. Thank you for letting me know that you're there. Thank you. Um, and all the other people who are writing in now, thank you very much. It's always a question whether we're live or not, but here we are. And we are gathering for the second week of the parables. And yes, we are in my house, and yes, I am sitting at my dining room table. So maybe you can think that I'm just sitting across from you, and you're welcome here. I'm also watching our little dog who we rescued walking in and out of the house. She hasn't decided which way to go yet, so there's always a distraction. This evening, I'd like to begin by bringing your attention to some really points to remember when looking at the parables. And there's four points. The first one is, what is the context? Because a lot of times when you hear homilies in church and so forth, well, the story gets a little misunderstood or misused or I don't know, we got to be very careful. Context. What is the context of all of these stories that Jesus tells? They are all about the kingdom of God. That is the context that they are within. Okay? And then we ask, what is the culture? The Bible isn't written to you and to me. The Bible is written for you and me. But particularly in the Gospels, when we hear Jesus speaking, he's speaking to specific people in a certain culture. Now, those of you who live in New York, just think about New York City. When you go, I mean, we even name it, we name it Little Italy, Chinatown, right? Um, East Harlem. Each of these communities have a totally different culture. And from place to place, there's different meanings, sometimes to the very same thing. So you not to recognize this because sometimes a word or a gesture that you say in one place and is welcome and accepted is considered an insult in another place. So you have to know the culture within which the story is placed. So first is the context, the kingdom of heaven kingdom of God. The second is the culture. This is a Jewish culture, but it is wrapped up in control of a Roman culture. So both things are going on at the same time. With the door open, excuse me, I seem to have an itchy nose. I'm allergic to the trees that are still in bloom. The third is, who are the characters? Who Who's in the story? And once we see who's in the story, then we are called to enter the story and say, who am I in the story? Which one of these people am I in the story? Or could be an animal, right? And I think it's important to do that because that prevents us, after we hear that, to say, oh yeah, that was a nice story, and just dismiss it. That was a nice story. So who are the characters? And then fourth, what is the challenge? Parable stories are not about information. They are about transformation. Transformation of the hearers, people who hear the story. So when we know the challenge of the story, then we can say, how do I respond to this challenge? Four things, context, culture, characters, challenge. I almost got, well, we did. We did, we got four C's there, right? This evening, we're gonna focus on three stories. I call them the parables of the lost and found. And why we're doing three is, first of all, they follow each other. They're in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. Maybe you want to remember that to take a look at them yourself. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. 
and they're about lost and found. And the more I thought about it, I thought about these days, there seems to be so much that has been lost, isn't there? And every evening, just about this time, uh, I watch a lot on Channel 2. I watch the news on Channel 7, I turn to Channel 2. Either place, I see the same thing. It says, have you seen? And it's a picture of a kid, usually a teenager, 14, 15, 16 years old. And it says, have you seen them? They're missing. And my response to this is, where are they? Where are they? Now, it's really easy to judge. And one time someone was here and said to me, oh, they're probably runaways, or maybe they're on drugs. Oh, no. They are our corporate loss. They are our children. In the three stories, there's three things missing, three things lost. A sheep, a coin, and a, son, and a son. Who is Jesus speaking to, and what is the context? Before he tells these stories, Jesus is at dinner at a very powerful Pharisee's house. If you look back into chapter 14, you see he's at dinner. Now, my understanding is that many times, because it was very warm in the Holy Land, dinner was out on a portico. In the public, people used to walk by, right? And a man came by who had dropsy. And Jesus looked to the Pharisee and he said, is it permissible to heal on the Sabbath? And the Pharisee didn't answer. And Jesus got up and went over to the man and healed him. Now gathered around Jesus was a whole group of people. And over here you had the Pharisees. And over here you had what's called the sinners. And the sinners weren't necessarily, they could have been people who were committing sin, okay? but there were sinners and the tax collectors. So the sinners were outcasts. They were people who the Pharisees declared unclean, not fit, because they didn't follow the rules that the Pharisees had established. And then you had the tax collectors and everybody hated them, right? Because they worked for the Romans and they robbed the people. These are two very different groups. This is who Jesus is speaking to and we get to listen in. And what he's doing is he's inviting both groups into the right way of being with God, into the kingdom. He is telling them how God thinks. Two groups, very different thinking. The sin is, they're lost and they know it. The Pharisees are lost, but they don't know it. And as the listeners, isn't it true that sometimes we're in one group and other times we're in the other group? You know, my friend who judged those kids who are lost, well, my friend didn't know another friend of mine who was a kid living on the streets in New York City and addicted to heroin. My friend, took standing over with the Pharisees. I was hanging out with the sinners. Also, I enjoyed them a lot more. I, but what we're told in the stories is God is ready, God is waiting, open and searching for us. And God is accepting us as we are. Now let's look at the stories. I was going to read them to you, but I think I'll tell them to you. Right? The first is the story of the lost sheep. You've probably heard these along the way. There's a hundred sheep. Now, that's a very big flock of sheep and probably owned by more than one person. And there was probably more than one shepherd, okay? But that's the culture. A sheep went missing. It wasn't just a sheep. 
to that shepherd. It was a particular sheep, precious. And without it, the flock was not whole. And the shepherd went searching. If you ever had a dog who was lost, which I have had, you will know what it's like to go searching, right? And, but the sheep, a, lot, a sheep is terrified when they're on their own. Terrified. Just wandered away and all of a sudden was on his own. And oftentimes they fall into these holes they can't get out of. And that is why, a point of information, the shepherd has a crook. Because a fearful sheep okay, can almost become paralyzed in fear. And if they fall into a hole, what they do is they run around and run around, much like a dog, right, until they kind of collapse and fall asleep. And then what the shepherd does is he puts the crook down the hole and lifts up the sheep. Now that sheep is terrified and almost paralyzed in fear. That's what happens to them. So the shepherd puts the sheep around his shoulders to carry him and also to give him comfort. And when he brings it back, the flock is whole. This is success, big success. It's time for a party because the name of the story changes from the lost sheep to the found sheep. I think these people look for any time, any opportunity to have a party, as we'll see. And I myself enjoy any opportunity to have a party. And maybe you do too, right? First story. Now, when you read it in the scripture in Luke 15, it may sound a little different, but this is the gist, okay? This is the story by Sister Pat. The second story is the lost coin. Now, there's many different interpretations on this story. It goes anywhere from the coin was worth a day's wages to a month's pay. Now for any woman who has ever been caught short in a store and is really doesn't have enough money, maybe this has happened to you, I know it's happened to me and Michelle told me it happened to her. What you do is you empty out your purse, right? And you go in the bottom to try to find the loose change. We all have loose change swimming around there in the bottom of our purses. And, well, and we look around until we get enough and we find the precious coin. It's usually a quarter. We're like, wow, it wasn't a dime or a nickel down here. It was a quarter, okay? Now, maybe that's not much, but in that moment, wasn't it everything? You didn't have to put anything back. You were a little embarrassed, but it didn't matter because that coin, that what we found, makes the whole amount. For the woman in the scripture story, that coin that was missing made it whole, finding that coin. And then we get to the parable that we all know very well, the parable of the prodigal son. Actually, it should be called the prodigal father because he is the loving one, right? He is the one extending. The father is the center of the story, not the son. Not the son. And what we see the father doing is the father's waiting, wringing his hands, ready, searching. Have you ever done that when your kid, you know, the kid who packed up a little suitcase and snuck out the back door, was gonna run away to where, I don't know, but you looked all over for him and you waited and you waited. By the time it got dark, they usually came home because they didn't know what to do, right? But it was still fearful. This father waited a while. He sees his son and he runs to meet him. It doesn't matter that he's been made unclean by being with the pigs. No, he's my, he says, he's my son. He embraces him. And what does he do? He has a big party. I forgot to mention the woman also had a party. She probably spent the coin on refreshments, right? And the father throws a big party. And then we get to the other son. Same father, just as much love, 
and this son is bitter and he's judging. See, Jesus is speaking where? To those Pharisees, he's judging. And I always ask myself, did he go into the party? Did he go into the party? Maybe he walked in, made a plate and left. But could he get out of himself enough to celebrate that his brother was home? Now in these three stories, gotta remember the audience, the characters. One knows that they're lost. The other, the Pharisees, don't have a clue that they're lost from the kingdom of God because they're living by rules, rules that they made. And some of these rules were horrible. How far could you walk, right? What could you lift up on the Sabbath? It became more and more restrictive. And in some ways, our church has gone through periods of time like that. You know, I often think of um, people who went for an annulment. Maybe you did, so you know what it was like. It was a horrible process, horrible, lengthy and horrible. One of the first things Pope Francis did when he became Pope was to say the annulment processes in every diocese must change. We need to embrace people in their pain, not make them suffer more. Do you hear that? Where is he standing? He's not standing with this group over here. He's standing with the sinners and the tax collectors. So, you know, to be lost is something we all have experienced, isn't it? We've all experienced being lost. Sometimes we know we're lost and other times we don't. Have you ever said, I've got to get myself together? And don't tell me you haven't said that because everybody said that. I've got to get myself together. Or I just feel lost in space. These comments tell us that we are aware that we're missing something. We're, we're aware that we've lost something. And after this most difficult year, I guess I just want to ask the question, have I lost part of myself this year? I have a friend of mine who's an elderly person, which means older than me now. Okay, could be a year older than me and they're elderly, right? Um, and I used to visit him. And during the pandemic, he couldn't have visitors. And the other day I'm speaking to him on the phone and I said, well, when can I see you? And he said, you know, I don't know because I don't have anybody over and I really don't go out. I talk to people on the phone. He lost a part of himself during this time and he's fearful, he's fearful. And that troubled me greatly, but it also made me ask myself that question. And I ask you, what have you lost of yourself during this year? And the question that follows that is, what parts of my life am I searching for? I'm kind of searching for a live audience. <laughs> And uh, I hope that the number of you can come to the porch chats in July. There's plenty of room, plenty of air, plenty of space uh, to be with other people who are also searching. So that would be important for me to see you. Right now, believe it or not, I am looking at myself and only seeing people's names on the side of the screen that I know who's with me here in this. The other question I think comes do you ever just feel like something is missing, even if you don't know what it is, or have a sense of restlessness that there's more to life? Maybe, just maybe, this is our God knocking on our hearts. In truth, we can lose parts of ourselves to grief and to sorrow, for sure. The pains and wounds of knocking into each other to fear and anger. People are so afraid and they're so angry. 
You know, I live in a town that has a lot of four-way stop signs. And, I don't know, lately, it seems that people don't want to stop at those four-way stop signs. They come crashing through them. I always stop. I stop at people on both sides of it because I don't know what they're going to do. People are so angry. They're just driving. I want to say, let's stop for a moment and look at our souls and say, what am I searching for? And our political atmosphere certainly has not hurt, helped these past couple of years, you know? A friend of mine said to me, I just want my family back. My family is torn apart by different opinions. Maybe that's true in your family, huh? Torn apart by different opinions. And what's happening is people would rather judge than try to understand. I knew a man, really he was uptight. He was an uptight person. And um, when his um, son told him that he was gay, the father threw him out of the house. And a few years later, they didn't know the son was missing. They didn't know where he was. They got a call from somebody in Manhattan telling them that their son had AIDS and he was dying. That same father who was so judgmental got in the car, drove to New York City, carried his son out of that apartment, brought him home and cared for his son until his son died. That to me is the biggest transformation from judging to understanding to overall loving that I could think of in sharing, getting ready to share this with you. And sometimes the part of ourselves that is lost is the dream. You know, I turned 72 years old a couple of weeks ago. I'm happy about it. I, I'm not, I'm, would I rather be 62? Oh, sure, whatever. You know, it, it all sounds good, but this is where I am. This is who I am. And I'm uh, feeling good about it. I have some friends of mine around my age, and I'm really worried about them because they seem to have lost their sense of wonder. They've lost their sense of wonder. And they don't even know it. And now when I say, come on, let's go outside and look at the stars, they go, what, it's dark, or it's cold, or it's something, right? And I'm like, oh my goodness. You know, um, Michelle and I always look for opportunities to experience wonder. And people laugh at us. You know, I did notice that as you get older, you can't skip anymore. Maybe you've noticed that. You just lose the ability to skip. I was looking at my neighbor. She's seven years old. She was skipping down the walkway. And I went, I can't do that. But I still have a dream. I still have a dream. Have you lost that? Have you lost your sense of wonder? You know, the more negative we get, the more closed we become, and we lose parts of ourselves. And right there, Jesus is saying, I am looking for you. I'm looking for you. I'm searching for you. Help me search for those parts of you. Because if we settle for less, we will surely only get less. And my dear friend, Father Frank Gator, said often, more is more. He enjoyed more of mostly anything, especially a good meal. But more is more. What about grace upon grace? Love upon love. In the very first chapter of St. John's Gospel, we hear that, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And of his <clears throat> fullness, we have all had a share. Grace upon grace, love upon love. If you settle for less, you will get less. The shepherd did not say, you know, it looks like rain. The sheep will have to wait till the morning. He didn't say that, did he? No, he didn't. And the woman didn't say, well, maybe that coin is under that heavy piece of furniture. Let's forget it. No way. 
No way. She got a broom with a really long handle and went under that piece of furniture. I made that part up because I don't know if there was a piece of furniture there. But there might have been. And the father <clears throat> didn't say about his son, well, he deserved it. Maybe it will teach him a lesson. What kind of lesson do children learn when their parents abandon them, leave them to learn a lesson? I don't know. I wasn't raised in a family like that, so I don't know. But I do know what it means to experience love following upon love in a family. What about a child or a grandchild who's different? Different, in many ways different. Do you ignore? Do you judge? Or do you embrace? What is this story telling us? Which group are we in? Remember, we can move back and forth. All parables are about our loving God and the kingdom of God welcoming us in as we are, not as we should be, not as we hope to be, but as we are. Jesus told the parables, particularly these three, to let the sinners know that they are found and to show the Pharisees they have lost their way, that they can soften and have a change of heart. So true for all of us in the stories of the lost and found. Jesus told these stories so you and I could share in the hope given to the children of God. Because as St. Paul tells us, we are the adopted children of God. We are the brothers and sisters of Jesus. So these stories all belong to us. Don't miss them. If you pick up Luke's Gospel, and if you don't have a Bible, I would suggest two Bibles you could get. One is the uh, New American, and it there's a paperback edition, very reasonable. And the other is sold by Catholic book publishers, and it's called the Catholic Bible. Very lovely translation, both. Uh, second, I like the translation better. But open up Luke's Gospel and start to read into it. As you read along, you'll be called to enter into the stories. Luke tells many, many parables. Right in that 14, 15, he probably has seven parables right there. Remember, it's the context, the culture, the characters, and the challenge. Write that down if you have a pencil there, right? The contact, context of the story, the culture with, that the story is within, the characters in the story, and the challenge of the story. And then with every one of the parables, take those four points and enter the story. The, that scripture was not written to us, it was written for us. It was spoken and written to other people, so we are invited in, and that makes it our story now. It's so important that the word of God finds a place within our hearts and that we find a home in the word of God. This is not just something we hear on Sunday. It really is an invitation to a great, wonderful, deep life with God. That's why I do this to help you and other people enter more fully into the relationship with God. So don't miss the parables of the lost and found. 
because God is always reaching out to the parts of us that we've lost along the way. Next week, we will take another group of parables. There's a number of them that are done in groups, right? And uh, hopefully to invite you into more and more of the stories so you become part of the stories. And then when you hear them, somebody will say, yes, I remember that. And I'm here in the story. And God has called me home. God has called me home into his heart. Just think about how that son in Luke 15 felt when his father embraced him. He didn't punish him. He didn't ostracize him. He threw a feast. He threw a feast. I hope that this week you discover or rediscover the sense of wonder that is in you. Don't let it pass. If you don't have a dog who drags you out after dark, go out on your porch tonight and look at the stars. There's an alignment, I believe, tonight of um, the Earth, the Mars, and Venus. And, and you see it in the western sky. A wonder. Stardust. We each have some stardust in us. They say we're made from stardust. Enjoy it. Enter the wonder. Celebrate that you have a home in your God. And I look forward to seeing you next week. And don't forget the porch chats. And please, this week, just touch somebody else's life with kindness that maybe they will begin to open up to being found. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me know that you're online. And please share this with other people. Tell them to look it up on Facebook. And tell your friends who are not on Facebook that I'll be sending out a link that they can watch this. Uh, my, the Amityville Dominicans are picking it up from the Facebook and they're putting it on the Amityville Dominican YouTube channel. So they'll be able to watch it on there. I appreciate your company tonight. I hope to see you in person soon. And I think I will remember what most of you look like except Cookie. Long time. And um, many, many blessings and have some fun this week. Thank you. Good night.